just again reiterating the point that um, a, a brain that's ill cannot recognize its illness often. And so the person who is a 24-year-old who's spiraling out of control, you might have to do a TDO 5, 10, 15 times. No, what do you mean by that? Sorry, the temporary detainment order. So you might have to in encourage them, confront them with their illness countless times until they're ready to, to face it. And, th and the best way to do that is not, like was said earlier tonight, not out of anger, not out of frustration, not out of a sense of worry or excessive anxiety, but just clearly speaking to them in a neutral tone with love and saying, I'm concerned. I think this might be an issue. Are you willing to consider getting help? And, and it's going to take a lot of energy, and it's going, but if you can maintain the neutral tone and not try to um, force a lot of emotion into it, you might save some of that energy in just expressing the love. And, and again, you might end up saying it a thousand times before someone, you know, I've, I know someone personally who it took them about 10 years of people, their closest family members saying, you need help, you have an illness, you have to stay on your medication. You need help, you have an illness, you have to stay on your medication. And so that, again, that faithfulness of the loved one to be able to genuinely show that concern time after time, even when they think, oh, they're ignoring me, and oh, they don't care, and oh, they don't, must not you know, love me or, or love themselves enough. You just have to keep going. And it's, and it's difficult, and it's trying, but that perseverance and that patience done in love is really one of the, the best ways to eventually access a person in need. Did you have one more comment? The only thing I was going to say was that oftentimes the ill person, we're the last ones to recognize we're getting it. We're spiraling. We, we don't realize it. And so the, the family members need to be aware that you are that person's barometer. And you need to be, you know, if it weren't for my husband saying, you know, Nancy, you are, you're starting to do X, Y, and Z. And I'm thinking, well, I'm, no, I'm, I'm okay. And so that's something, too, that is um, uh, a, a characteristic of the, the illness is that we don't see it in ourselves like our, our spouses and our family members do. Final question for the evening. It's more of a technical one. I think. <coughs> does bipolar disease lead to depression or does depression lead to bipolar disease? Let's let the professional answer that. Oh, <laughs> Bipol bipolar disease is a combination of depression and mania. It's a highs and lows. Some of your celebrities, um, if you look back on at Christy McNichol, for you guys who could remember Christy McNichol, if you look at sometimes Robin Williams, you know our comedians that we really, you know, we relish seeing their their humor. Um, they have that, that's they're very high and up and they're funny. That's their manic phase. Okay, we don't see them on stage unless they take in their cocaine when they're in the deeper depression. With the illness, the manias get shorter. The depressions get longer. They crave for the manias because they can do so much things. They're creative. They don't like the medication because the medication takes away that fun stuff. So to answer your question, bipolar disorder is a depressive disorder. It has the highs and lows. And over the course of the illness, we don't know why, but they get more depression and less of the highs. And we don't know this either, but after the age of 60, we don't see the symptoms anymore. So is it hormonal? I don't know. I did my dissertation on that. I say yes. <laughs> uh, if anybody in this room know Carol Ann, could you describe her? She's definitely very, very energetic. Um, I so she was kind of over the top a little bit and yeah, kind of the life of the party and the life. Yeah, yeah, and that's the way the public saw her. Kind of this bigger than life person. And that's oftentimes very creative. That's often what they call hypomanic. Manic is when you're doing some really crazy stuff. But hypomanic is when you've got all the energy in the world and you can be like Superman. And when you look at her resume, it's Superman-like, Superwoman-like. So manic doesn't always mean, you know, taking off your clothes and running down the street. Somebody shared with me 
what one of their manic sides was, was they convinced themselves they were moving, so he got rid of all his furniture and threw it away. Then he realized he wasn't moving. All right? That's manic. Carol Ann and many bipolar sufferers are hypomanic, a little less severe, but really energetic, oftentimes very popular, very creative, just get a lot done. There is no empirical test for bipolar disorder. There is no empirical test. There's a group out of Chicago that's working on this right now, a foundation with about 50 or 60 of the top psychiatrists in the country trying to come up with an empirical test. And even the smartest brains in the world can't come up with it. And that's about the zone suppression test. All right, one, one last one. Thank you. Um, I personally was diagnosed with bipolar at a very young age. I was medicated for well over half of my life. And uh, fortunately for me, I've been doing well now. I have a five-year-old son. He just started kindergarten. And his teacher is actually telling me he is showing signs of bipolar. And I don't know if that's ridiculous, because I was diagnosed at a young age. But how do you tell the difference between a five-year-old and a five-year-old and a five-year-old who needs mental health? Um, I will tell you that most kids who are treated for ADHD, we now are looking at more and more studies that are showing that they are actually sh uh, later in life showing more signs of bipolar disorder. Um, it is very typical. Your child is ha is uh, active. He's uh, probably jumping and doing things uh, that, that normal kids do. I will tell you that your concern comes to diagnosing him when he starts taking risks um, that are inordinate risk. And that's something he talked about with his, his daughter, that she did a lot of risky behavior, taking, you know, leaving off the, the, uh, the house, uh, out of the trees, running in front of traffic. When it becomes dangerous, that you really are going, <gasps> waiting to exhale, then I think that you need to diagnostically look at him. And I would ask you, I will tell you this one story. I had a, a five-year-old um, child who was the son of a Navy SEAL. And Navy SEALs don't believe in mental illness, at least the one that I would talk to. His son was so angry from getting in trouble at school all the time with his peers that he envisioned that when the kids took their nap, he was going to sharpen the pencils and stick their eyes out. That kid is a danger to others because he thought he wouldn't get in trouble because he could run faster than the stat police officers. Now, that's a busy child's mind. That's a dangerous child. And you say, does that kid need help? Well, only if your child slipped in the next cot next to him. The, the judge ordered the child on medication. So again, watch your son, keep your son close, listen to the teachers, and they're seeing him a lot during the day. If he's making dangerous behaviors towards himself and others, I think it would be merit a look -see. That's all I'd say about that. And this illness is highly <coughs> genetic. Somebody asked me shortly after Caroline passed away a very odd question. They said, by the way, Todd, is any, any of your family members schizophrenic? That's a pretty heavy question for anybody. Well, the answer is yes. Michelle's brother is schizophrenic. Her sister has some issues. Her grandfather is an alcoholic. I mean, that Caroline was probably an alcoholic. We know alcoholism is genetic. So is mental illness. There might be some other factors as well, some triggers. I'd like to follow up on that. I have a 21-year-old, a 23-year-old, and a 24-year-old. We were busy with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when they were younger, I don't think they had any clue what they were living. I have made it a point to talk to each of them, now that they're adults, to know what I live with, so that they can be watching themselves and watching each other. I, I think that's, uh, that, was, that was the hardest thing to do. I, I've spoken to lots of people, other people, who talk to my own children and say, hey, your dad suffers from depression. Uh, sorry, I, I, I'll take that sucker out. I live with depression. Um, and you need to be aware of it yourself.